Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcella Cates from MAP, and I am pleased to welcome you to the webinar, The Resin Crisis, Information Every Plastics Executive Must Know. Today's webinar is presented by Bruce Flannery and Jeff Schultz of AMCO, and also Alan Rothenbucher of Benish. AMCO and Benish are two great sponsors of MAP, and we're happy to have them share their expertise, expertise with us today. So before we get started, I just want to touch on a few logistics. We will be keeping all attendees muted throughout the presentation. We are recording the webinar and we it will be up on our website under the webinar archives page um, in the next day or so for the MAP members on the line. If you are a customer of AMCO, they will also have the recording to share with you. We also will make the uh, PowerPoint presentation available as well. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please use the question box on the GoToWebinar pop-up to ask any questions as we go through. And in addition, if you have any logistical issues, you can use the question box and my team will help you troubleshoot. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Troy Nix, MAPS Executive Director, who will give a quick update and welcome. Over to you, Troy. Hey, Marcella, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to tell everybody I very much appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, the state of the marketplace has been very interesting. But before I go any further, I've been receiving a lot of very interesting emails, and uh, our members are sending me uh, some of the correspondence that they're receiving from their customer base. That's why we're on the phone today. It goes something like this. Dear valued supplier, as a result of continued material component constraints in the global marketplace, the criticality of proactive materials management is of the utmost importance to ensure our continued supply is protected. It's your responsibility to take all necessary steps to protect and ensure your ability to comply with your obligations to deliver parts and materials according to delivery schedules and our contract. It's very interesting as I read these over and over again, and Alan, I'm sure you've seen them, is the context that it really doesn't matter from their vantage point uh, because there is no issue in the marketplace. So one of the reasons for bringing everybody together is to give you more information because we strongly believe in this organization that information is power and that you can use this information in a variety of different ways. And I think Alan is gonna go over some of those ways uh, to ensure that uh, you're watching forward and also looking backward at the same time. So with that said, I'd like you to go to the next slide, please, if you can, Marcella. As of, uh, I would say, uh, close of business yesterday, uh, the MAP organization is averaging between two to three emergency alert messages a day. And those emergency alert messages are coming for a variety of different materials. And I think it's important when I put this out there, and I sent a video out last Monday, and it's the context that, you know, please read the emails. This is where our organization and the power of the network is at its greatest. And 450 different companies are coming together because one company needs something and everybody else is looking for it that we can help one another. And so last Friday, we received a call from one of our processors that basically said, the website is becoming overwhelmed with needs, but some of us have material that is obsolete and could help others in need. So we actually created this on the run on Friday. So now when you go to the actual form position on the website, you will see materials needed and materials available. So I'm putting out a plea for help. If everybody on the line today, we have over 200 registrants. If everybody on the line today can just take 15 to 30 minutes of time, identify your materials that are obsolete, not gonna be used and upload those because it could be a gold mine to somebody else. You know, that, that concept, Alan, right? One man's uh, uh, trash is another man's treasure. Uh, will go into play here. I can't tell you if we get 300 companies that will upload their available materials. And go ahead, Marcella, go to the next slide and you can kind of see where it's beginning to work right now. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, we've got uh, uh, ABS and we've got uh, all sorts of stuff that now are going up, uh, PET. Uh, on the site. So we want you to search this, but we also want you to upload this. So with that being said, very interesting. Received a call a couple weeks ago from Stacy Shelley of AMCO. AMCO has been a longtime sponsor of the organization and Stacy basically said, Troy, we need to get information to the members. 
ASAP and try to keep them updated on this changing circumstance. Jeff just told us that, hey, we could give it today. In a week, it's going to be different. Probably 45% of the material is going to be different. So we'll do our best to keep everybody uh, in line with what's happening. But part of this today also is bringing Alan Rothenbucher, uh, who is our corporate attorney and has given valued services to a variety of different members across the organization. But Alan is here to give uh, some advice and some guidance relative to what uh, he feels you should be doing uh, as a supplier uh, to a lot of these large OEMs who don't recognize that there's a global issue at stake. So with that being said, Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Troy. All right. So let's assume you got the letter that Troy just read. So how do you as a molder get out of the del delivery deadline if you just can't get any resin? And customers, as Troy said, are still telling you that you need to make parts. And ex some people are telling you, you got to expedite deliveries as if the weather event in Texas never happened. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you the options you have available. So as Troy indicated, I'm Alan Rothenbeeker. I act as general counsel for MAP and sit on the board of directors. I also lead my law firm's plastics industry service line, a bunch of lawyers with various kinds of expertise located in offices throughout the U.S. And lately, I've been dealing a lot with fending off customer demands to hold pricing and delivery deadlines. So what do you do? Well, there's four things, as you see on this slide, that you can do. One of them under contract, three under the law. The most common tactic for pushing back on unreasonable customer demands on delivery and pricing is a force majeure clause, which is often, but unfortunately not always, in your contracts. So such clauses generally set forth limited circumstances under which you can terminate or fail to perform, frankly, without liability due to the occurrence of an unforeseen event, like the events in Texas. And often your supplier will declare force majeure and you can piggyback right off that. That's the best scenario and tell your customer that your deliveries will be similarly delayed or you need to pass along a price increase. If you have a provision like that in a contract with your customer, give notice now. And if, if you've not already done so, and if you don't have a provision like that in your contract, you really, really need to start including those provisions. We talked about it before with respect to the pandemic, and now you have events like this. If you haven't done it in the past or haven't made those changes yet, shame on you. You got to start doing that now. Nothing better than the written word. All right. So what about what about the scenario where if the, you don't have it in your contract, right? So you want to be able to tell the customer that the leather, the weather and the lack of resin is triggered. You'd like to say it's triggered an event under the force majeure clause and you're exclu exclu excusing your late deliveries. And then you'll just keep your customer regularly updated. But if your contract doesn't have a force majeure clause, there's still hope. The law gives you some options and those are listed on the slide. So what does each mean? Doctrine of impossibility. So that's something that's available when performance of a contract is rendered what's called objectively impossible. You must show that the impossibility was produced by an unanticipated event and the event could have not been foreseen or guarded against. And examples under the law include weather events, governmental regulations, disruption of transportation or communication networks to give you some examples. My opinion is that the events in, in Texas trigger the doctrine of impossibility. So that would be one, even if you don't have a force majeure clause in your contract, you would still write and send your letter out and declare under the doctrine of impossibility, particularly if it's available in your state, that that's what you're going to declare the equivalent of a force majeure. So the other one is the doctrine of commercial impracticability, great legal words, and it's available where performance is rendered impracticable. So what does that really mean? Well, it varies by state and across states with some treating it its own standalone defense, others saying that it's included under the umbrella of the impossibility defense. But it means that a person's uh, duty to perform under contract is excused where, quote, performance is impracticable by the occurrence of an event, the non-occurrence of which was a basic assumption on which the contract was made. That's a bunch of bullshit legalese. What it essentially means is that you cannot perform because of an unforeseen event. But remember, hardship alone is not enough. What you need to argue is that your pricing and delivery deadlines were premised on resin being available at a certain price point. And when those basic assumptions failed, performance became impracticable meaning you're excused from holding pricing and delivery deadlines. I've used those in a couple of states uh, successfully, so something for you to give some thought to also. Now, some states 
have a final defense, which is a call the frustration of purpose defense. And again, I'm giving you these in case you don't have a force majeure clause in your contract, just to let you know there's still hope out there to push back and that the law recognizes it. So this doctrine is available where there's a change in circumstance that makes one's party performance virtually worthless. In other words, frustrating the main purpose in making the contract. So how does that work here? So the purpose of your contract, your purchase order, is to make parts from resin. If the resin's not available, the contract makes no sense to continue. So in that case, the purpose is frustrated. Now, frustrating of pur frustration of purpose doesn't usually apply merely because it becomes more economically difficult to perform. But unavailability of resin, in my opinion, triggers this doctrine and excuses performance under a contract or at least it delays it until the event is ended. So what, are, what the message is to you, get your letters, your notices out to your customers. Put them on notice to protect yourself, but tailor them. Don't just do a blanket letter. Tailor them to your specific customers. Identify the product, identify the resin that's at issue or the material that's at issue, and then tell them, please tell them, that you're gonna, going to call them to discuss it in more detail. And when you call them, and please call them because you have to, and you should, explain the issue and the impact live to them and tell them that you're gonna allocate equally, unlike some, what some of your suppliers are doing, but tell them that you're gonna allocate equally and you're gonna monitor the market and give them regular updates. You make those kind of commitments to them that the information flow is gonna be going to them. Not only will you have a customer that is gonna probably react more favorably to it, but you're also ticking the boxes under the law for trying to excuse a delayed delivery, or if you have to really push a price increase along. So if you'd like to discuss this further offline, my contact info is below there in the slide. And as a MAP member, each of you gets two free hours of legal advice from my firm, so you might as well use it. And with that, if there's questions at the end, I'll stay online to answer those, but I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff Schultz from AMCO to, for the next part of the presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleased to provide a, uh, an update on behalf of AMCO Polymers and the issues that we're currently having in the plastic marketplace. Uh, we're excited to share our perspective um, and uh, have a bit of a disclaimer here that you know this really is our view of the market and in many cases is a broad overview uh, as we see the market today. Uh, our AMCO commercial team would be happy to engage with you directly to discuss any specific needs that you have and how we can best navigate these times together. So a few introductions, I'll go first and followed by my colleague, Bruce Flannery, who runs our commodity business. I'm Jeff Schultz, I'm the product director of engineering plastics at uh, Amco Polymers. I've been in the industry now for 23 years uh, in both commercial sourcing and uh, commercial leadership roles. I joined Rivago and Amco in 2013 and currently lead our engineering plastics business. I'm located uh, here in Orlando, Florida in AMCO and Rivago's North American headquarters. Bruce? Hey everybody, my name is Bruce Flannery. Uh, this is actually uh, my 40th year in plastic. Started out in the process side, extrusion and in, uh, in molding. Um, and uh, I did my first five years there, got into the resin side and since. So the last 35 years has been on the resin. Uh, it's been mostly on sales, both at producer level and distribution level. Uh, came aboard as part of Rivago in 2013 through the purchase of, uh, of ATOP polymers. Uh, between ATOP and AMCO, uh, we've been a distributor of Chevron Phillips polyethylene for over 40 years. So that's kind of my, my whole life has uh, kind of been on the, on the commodity polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene side of the business. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we're going to volley this back and forth between Bruce and I. Um, a little bit of our uh, take an opportunity to give you a little bit of a background on AMCO and Rivago before we get into uh, what will be the agenda and the root cause of the crisis that we're in. So one of the things we ask our or want our customers to think and feel about when they hear AMCO polymers 
is a fast, flexible company with an entrepreneurial attitude backed by the largest plastics distribution company in the world. Uh, the Rivago Group is the leading plastic and rubber distributor in the world, proud to have over 6,000 employees with about a third of them being customer facing in sales. 45,000 customers, over 230 locations in 57 countries. Uh, proud to have many suppliers of which we determine about 50 are strategic and an extremely broad portfolio of plastics. Uh, the business unit that Bruce and I both work for, Amco Polymers, um, we've got a commercial organization of around 90 people, uh, about 42 salespeople that um, we tend to have experienced folks in the industry uh, working with our customers. Uh, we've also added um, and invested heavily in an application development and technical support team uh, driven really around uh, the idea of customer innovation and in helping our customers grow. Our core suppliers are all long-term relationship contractual suppliers to us, and we value those relationships tremendously. And then finally, a world-class distribution network with the strength of Bravago behind Amco. We have the ability to inventory product utilizing our own warehouses or those that we contract with third-party logistics providers. Okay, a little bit of the agenda, then I'm gonna pass it over to Bruce to start talking about the root cause. So first, the root cause of the crisis. We're then gonna to try to give you an overview of how we see the market today, uh, the impact of the crisis on commodity resins, uh, the same on engineering, and then we'll finish with a few slides that really talk about some actionable steps that you can take to help reduce the impact of the resin crisis on your business. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, pass it off to Bruce to talk about the root cause of the crisis. Hey everybody, uh, this timeline I thought was important. Uh, we'll go, we'll actually drill down on each of these as we go through this presentation. But I kind of had to get to that start of where did where did this happen? How did this happen? Where did it begin? Um, and I know we hear a lot about everything goes back to COVID these days, but in reality, this this whole thing has kind of been building up to this. So COVID hit in March of 2020. Uh, we saw extreme, I would call it almost an overreaction by suppliers to the stock. They weren't really sure what was going to happen in the market space. They were afraid of demand destruction. Um, they over overcorrected, I believe, on the polymer side and, and took down too much inventory. Uh, but if you were also a refiner of oil, you probably didn't take enough down because there was and still is demand destruction on the refinery side. In the meantime, uh, demand surged. Uh, we saw a just change in consumer patterns. Uh, we're in with the with COVID-19. It just there is no there was no forward look. Everything everybody's models about what was going to happen was based on normal things. This is totally uh, totally beside normal. So demand surged for most of our products um, for all, multiple reasons. We'll get into those. We came into the worst hurricane season of in years, ran out of hurricane names that was so bad. We'll talk about that a little bit further along too. And we saw the whole logistics industry become overwhelmed. And that's just not domestic, that's import and export the whole world. Um, and here's the here's the part that's unbelievable really is the world demand continues to surge. So we'll, we'll speak to that. Uh, so kind of the uh, cherry on the, on the top of this ice cream sundae is uh, the Uri freeze of Texas and Louisiana. So we decimated the refinery and chemical operations. So we'll drill down a little bit on those. Um, it's kind of uh, interesting times, as they say. Go ahead, Jeff, the next slide. So I'll give you a little further state of the resin markets. Um, one of our sellers came up with this, to be very frank with you. So Rich was like, he said, Bruce, why don't you just put a picture of a dumpster fire up? And I said, you know, Rich, you got a good point. Um, it's kind of like, we don't know where to start. This is my 40 years, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, like Jeff said, our group as a team has uh, on average over 20 years experience and, and none of us really have seen anything like this. Uh, I actually reached out to a colleague of mine that's been in the business over 50 years. I said, all right, there's something I'm missing. He said, nope. He said, we've never seen this. So the whole thing is what it is. Um, it is just kind of a crazy time. They say a picture says a thousand words. Um, so we've got three pictures. Uh, we had one of our poly, poly uh, olefin suppliers. Uh, we reached out to them and said, how do we describe this? Explain to them we were having this meeting. They want to get this information out too. They want to understand. They want to be running. They want to get you your resin. Uh, but this is at a, 
at a polymer plant in Texas. Um, this is just the damage. He, they took pictures of the unions and joints and valves that just cracked. Uh, part of the problem is they said they probably would have been okay or would have had a lot better chance of staying okay if they hadn't lost natural gas and electrical supply. Uh, they can take these plants down to what they call idle status and, and circulate water and, and try to keep them going. An unusual event on this cold weather, I'm not trying to say it would have saved them, but it may not have been as bad. But the whole failure of the electrical system and the natural gas supply just crippled them. So this gives you kind of an example of what they've been dealing with since the, uh, since the freeze. And these are the things they're trying to repair. As you can imagine, you know, everybody's out trying to buy these parts right now. And, and, and doing their repair. So we're in repair mode at the moment. Oh, sorry, next slide, Jeff. Thanks. So I thought this was an important the chemical industry flow chart. So this chart is available at amcopolymers.com. There's a, a link to it on the front page. I strongly recommend if, you, if you're interested in this to go ahead and download it. Uh, you can actually print it or take it to a printer. It's set up to print on a two by three poster. Um, the, I've shared these and we've updated this for years. A lot of our customers find them extremely helpful when explained to their customers uh, where it all comes from, actually being even on training with employees to understand just how big a part of the industry or how big the industry is and where their part is in it. So I do ask you, you know, please go reach out and uh, download that and share. Um, anyway, the big point to this is that it's, it wasn't just us on the polymer side that got nailed with Yuri, it was the whole, it's the whole enchilada, right? So all the way back from the natural gas slowed down, crude oil stopped being pumped, um, and so all the way through. So all of this needs to be up and running in order to get a polymer supply up and running. So again, this is something we've never seen before. Um, it's just unbelievable is the best way to say it. Go ahead, Jeff. So we get down to the chemical. Now we just took the bottom part of the of the slide here. And the reason we did that is to a little bit less of an eye chart so you can get into it um, and, and kind of get down to the nitty gritty of even how far down the supply chain, once you get onto the chemical side, off of the refinery side, how much more still has to happen. So again, it's only a way to try to express to you, um, nobody wants to be in this. And this thing is a, a bigger overall problem than is probably it's very hard to explain and uh, we reach out to to you with this hoping that it'll explain explain it for you um next over i'm going to turn it over to jeff we've got four different segments we kind of want to break this out into yeah thanks bruce before we we leave this slide i think one of the things that we talked about in preparation for today was the sequencing of events that has to happen when these chemical plants begin startup um, you've got to go through that chain and through that flow chart before you get down to, uh, in many cases, the red arrows and the products that you see we've highlighted. So when you see nylon and polycarbonate, the two red arrows on the far bottom left, there is a, a lot of sequencing that has to take place before they're even in a position to start producing uh, a pound of nylon, a pound of polycarbonate, or a pound of olefin. Um, so these things, they can't race down to make polycarbonate. It all has to kind of flow in sequence. Jeff, before you go to the next slide, thank you. That's actually a good segue. I hadn't thought about that a little further. We've seen the same thing uh, just in updates in the last 48 hours from our uh, polyethylene polypropylene suppliers where they're saying, hey, we think we can get the plant back up, i.e. the polymer plant back up, uh, but it'll be at very reduced rates until we get the ethylene or the propylene supply. So. Uh, we now they're doing that on purpose because at least they can prove that the plant is operational. They can go through the test. They can go through the startup. So you will hear things about plants starting up. That does not mean that there's full production because you've got to wait for all the, all the supplies in order to run. Thanks, Joe. Sure. Okay. So there's a lot that we could have um, chosen to talk about for today's presentation, and Bruce and I really kind of put it into these four quadrants of supply demand. Uh, labor, logistics, and, and then price inflation. Um, you know, broadly speaking, uh, supply of both domestic and imported resins is short and worsening in the near term. You know, we obviously know what happened down in Texas and Louisiana that just crippled the petrochemical production. Um, global demand, as Bruce mentioned earlier, uh, continues to remain strong, which is driving additional inflation. Lead times are extending. Uh, we've got products that were at one point in time 12, 12 weeks, which 
at that point in time was long for resin, uh, now extending uh, beyond 20, uh, and, and imports can be even beyond, beyond that, upwards of 28 to 30 weeks. It's difficult to think about a um, customer trying to prepare what they're going to need, placing orders today for delivery in August and September. Labor challenges we're going to talk about and how COVID has impacted uh, productivity. The logistics industry is, is tight and worsening, including international freight, uh, and shortages um, are just causing uh, just a lot of chaos. So we're going to try to drill into these four buckets. Um, so the state of the resin uh, supply first, you know, COVID-19 just disrupted historical forecast models. Uh, we entered the first quarter of this year with very tight supplies. I asked a couple of uh, producers in the last few weeks, you know, where did you kind of enter or finish the year, enter 2021 as far as days on hand? And they kind of laughed, um, basically stating they didn't really have any unsold resin. Um, everything that they were trying to allocate, that they could allocate was, and future orders were basically allocated to resin that had yet to be produced. Um, imports from other region have slowed dramatically. In cases where we've had hurricanes or other supply disruption, um, the industry has been able to really use the global infrastructure and start importing product either from Europe or from Asia. And today with those regions um, having strong demand, getting imports is to any um, increasing degree is, is not likely. Roughly 80% of the domestic resin producers are either on allocation or force majeure today. Uh, in short, our market's undersupplied. Moving into demand, you know, March, April of last year, as Bruce said, the start of COVID, you, we saw a huge surge in the packaging and, and healthcare markets. Um, at about that same time or shortly thereafter, the automotive industry basically shut down. Um, shortly after April, May, the automotive industry began to strengthen and certainly surged in third and fourth quarter. At about the same time in the April, May timeframe, we all, of course, maybe that was in mid-March, it started where um, we were all asked to work remotely and to work from home. Uh, and our children moved from uh, learning in person to a remote learning environment. And what that did was it drove additional demand for electronics, things like computers, printers, Wi-Fi devices, and tablets. As we entered summer of 2020, uh, families realized that summer vacations and leisure travel was not going to happen, and they're certainly looking like they're going to be spending a lot more time at home as COVID, um, we were kind of in for the long haul at that point. So we saw consumer spending um, change dramatically. So markets like building and construction and the appliance industry really took off. Um, you've got appliance sales increased. We've seen statistics. I saw one that was staggering the, about the percentage increase in refrigeration sales from China to the United States. So white goods, uh, HVAC, televisions, and the DIY market um, really, really took off. And we're now at a point where most of those industries um, have stayed at very high levels of demand. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just showing a few slides for some of these markets, first being um, kind of the consumer market or building and construction. I saw this the other day and thought it would be interesting. It's easy on the eyes, easy to see in the red circle there. This is Home Depot, and it's a, me a historical measure dating back to the first quarter of 2017 on the left, um, second, third, and fourth quarter uh, 2020 on the right in the red, and this is their domestic same store sales. And you can see uh, fourth quarter was up 25% on a year over year basis. So just a, a massive surge uh, for Home Depot. Interesting statistic from one of their uh, earnings calls was that customers average purchase in a store uh, rose 11% uh, in fourth quarter and sales per square foot in their store rose 24%. Moving into automotive, this comes from Ward's Intelligence, uh, and it really just gives a graphical view of what's happened in our automotive uh, market. You can see the tremendous dip in the second quarter of 2020, and then really a fantastic rebound in third, fourth quarter, and, and forecasts for actually first quarter are, are going up. And I think the real 
I guess, take away from this slide, uh, maybe two. One is thankfully the automotive industry recovered. Um, secondly, is just the, the ripple effect that a huge demand um, swing like that provides in the entire supply chain, which we're now seeing in fourth quarter last year and the first quarter um, as we sit here today. Okay, the last slide here on, uh, on supply demand, again, is on the automotive side. Um, 2021 is projected to be just short of 2019, and they've already revised 21 uh, production builds to be uh, up already. So it'll be interesting to see as the year goes on, are we going to be able to catch 2019 production levels? Uh, as we finish the year, we're, we're at about a 500 to 600,000 unit inventory shortage. Um, therefore, the need to increase production. Um, so we're at a time where the automotive industry is trying to increase production and is being met with massive shortages in the supply chain. We've all probably read in the news about the semiconductor shortage. It will be interesting in the crisis we're talking about today. Um, does that lead to uh, shutdowns because plastic components are not available to be at the production sites, assembly facilities? Uh, pass it off to Bruce to go through the labor market. Okay, folks, on the labor side, it, this is, uh, and I'm sure all of you uh, can feel it yourselves with uh, your own with your own teams, uh, but what we've really seen, the things that have affected us on the uh, polymer side is the production facility. So we see the production facilities, the polymer side and our compounding partners, um, for the most part, they can actually keep, as long as the plants are running, they can keep people separated. They're very large plants. The polymer plants are mostly outdoors. Um, so they don't have a problem running them. The problem happens when there's an issue. Uh, so on the production facilities for us, it's when they have a problem. Number one, when they have a problem, they either don't have the people on site because they don't want them there, or they've got to call them in. So a thing of maybe something that would normally be a four hour turnaround turns into a two day turnaround to get a plant back up again. The big one that we saw on this, on our polymer side, is that uh, we schedule turnarounds, which are usually every three to five years, you can do a major turnaround on a polymer plant and uh, you have to follow, you, you have to do them. Uh, you can delay them. And that's what happened last year is that quite a few people were able to push uh, because of COVID-19, they were able to push the turnarounds from last year into this year, hoping that we would have some more relief on COVID and that people would be further along with the, um, with the vaccines. But unfortunately, they're at a point now where the vaccines are well and they've got to do the turnarounds. They, can't, they cannot delay them again. Now, the interesting thing to come to find out when I talk to some of the suppliers about this is that not only did we do that here in the North America side, but we did it in the plants in, in the Gulf states and we also did it in the plants in Asia. So we're all in the same boat. We have all have uh, production and turnarounds that we're going to happen last year. They got pushed to this year. Plus, we have the ones that are already scheduled for this year. So, again, a further thing: we were already uh, shipping hot pellets before any of this all happened. As far as we've been at the point where we've been on allocation, you folks may not have seen it or felt it so much, but due to production facility issues, we've been on allocations right along now since last summer, and we've been basically as soon as a car or a rail car residence ready or a truckload of boxes ready through QC, it gets shipped. There isn't any. So we call that shipping hot pellets. Um, the other problem that we're seeing with this on the polymer side is when you go into the plant, it's taken twice as long to do the turnarounds because they can't put, if you if you look at those pictures of the broken uh, pipes, instead of putting five people around that to try to get working on it to get it replaced, they can only put one or two out there uh, from a spacing uh, standpoint. So a normal 30-day turnaround for a plant that you do every three years is turning into a 60-day turnaround, or at least the ones that happened last year. They're doing their best to make them happen sooner because they're sold out. They actually want to get, they, they are desperate to ship resin, make resin and ship resin. Uh, so I'm going to tell you all effort is to make that happen, but you know, they're just, they're up against what they're up against. Just going to go into this a little bit on the next slide, but we've seen the same exact thing at the ports and logistics. Um, and we've also seen last minute production schedule changes on, our, especially the compounding suppliers where they've just, you know, they hope, they hope, they hope, and then they, you know, God forbid that uh, the COVID gets into the building. Um, so that's really been a, a huge problem for us. Uh, we've also seen shifting population. Uh, so we've seen labor relocating from high cost areas. So it's been coming harder and harder to get labor, at, at least for us at our facilities uh, that are in closer to the cities. Uh, people are just like had enough, they've moved out. And I'm sure you folks can probably uh, 
probably tell us stories about the PPP favored unemployment versus return to work, but we did see that hurt, uh, hit some of our supply side too. Jeff, back to you. Okay, the next few slides um, talk a little bit about logistics, and, and I apologize, this is a, an eye chart. Uh, on the left, you have the Morgan Stanley Freight Index, which is something that our logistics team um, uses and monitors. And the real takeaway on the left, I highlighted in yellow, uh, it really just speaks that right now there's about five orders needing to be shipped for every available truck on the road. So uh, you might wonder kind of, well, what is balance? It's not one-to-one. -one. Um, it's probably in the neighborhood of, of two orders per, per shipment. So the fact that we're more than 2X out of balance uh, gives some size and scale to, to what we're dealing with. Another thing I'll, I'll point out, um, the logistics industry really keeps an eye on when produce season is. So you're looking at produce season sometime uh, in the May to August timeframe. So as we're already dealing with a pretty, pretty tight logistics network, uh, we're gonna enter in the next uh, couple of months produce season, which is gonna make it a little bit more difficult. And I would imagine prices to climb. On the far right, you can see it's a bit of a historical slide. And when you get your own copy of this, I'm sure it'll be a little bit easier to see. But the takeaway here is that um, we've seen basically going back to second quarter of last year, a 30% upswing in freight activity. The next, uh, this slide I just thought was interesting, and I saw this um, for the first time um, rather recently, and what it does is it gives you a kind of a, a pictorial view of international cargo. Now, what this is, is every green dot that you'll see here on the map represents dry cargo. So this does not include tankers or other types of watercraft. This is just dry cargo that would represent the sorts of um, vessels that would carry plastic raw materials around the world as well as finished goods. Um, I just thought it gave a, a real good idea of what international logistics looks like on the water. Um, and the one comment I would leave around cost, um, it wasn't that long ago that you could move a vessel, a container from China to the US for the, what amounted to be about three to four cents a pound into the West Coast. So call it into the Port of Los Angeles or the Port of Long Beach. Today, that cost is over 10 cents a pound. So you're looking at more than 2X the, the cost to move a container out of China into the West Coast of the US. The next slide shows kind of port congestion, which is something that uh, we're dealing with now. Um, the port in Long Beach and Los Angeles uh, is extremely crowded. There's uh, by count of each of those green dots, I believe the green circles represent those, those boats or vessels that are, are anchored or are uh, important stationary and those that are the arrows are, uh, are moving, uh, free moving. You've got over 60 vessels either waiting or in port already. Um, what's happening is they're, they're out in the water floating for upwards of two to three weeks before they're able to get in and get offloaded. And what's happening is that extra two weeks that they're not unloading is two weeks that one product isn't moving in into the US marketplace, but it's also holding all of those vessels and holding most importantly now, all of the containers that have the resin in them to be released, to go back to Asia for us to get more product to come back. Container shortages, um, it just seems to be what everyone's talking about right now relative to the import export market is just container shortages in Asia. A lot of containers are sitting in the United States, Canada and Mexico and need to go back. And it's just compounding on itself at this point. I did hear uh, recently that there are vessels that are going back to Asia uh, with empty containers. They're not waiting for the containers to be filled. The containers are so needed back in Asia and given what costs are to move them back here, they're sending them back empty. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Bruce to finish kind of this four quadrant talk on inflation. So this this slide kind of gives the we're again what part of our mission here today is to share as much information as we can and kind of give you the overview, right? So um, in in when you put this out there, you just realize how bad this is. So the products in in red are, have a supply or force majeure issue, a true issue. So. All of these grades are currently in a force majeure situation. 
um, and on allocation. And those allocations can be minuscule, to be honest with you. We're having uh, very interesting conversations. But the reality is, is that we're, we're trying to find a way to show you just how bad it is. The other side of this, of course, is not only is there none, the prices continue to rise, right? So we have price increase announcements across the board on most of, if not all of these, and we expect them to keep going up. I'll speak a little bit more on the commodity side here in a minute, but again, we're coming, in, we're into uncharted territory here. I've never seen anything like this in our lives before. Jeff, you wanna hit the next slide? So first, we're going to, right now, I'm going to speak a little bit to the effects on my side of the business, the commodity side resin, which is mostly the polypropylene, polyethylene, um, and, and those, are, those are the two that are most impacted. Polystyrene is also under my uh, side of the business, uh, but luckily for us, it's not as impacted. So the most of this is on the polyethylene and polypropylene side. Go ahead, Jeff. So again, trying to express uh, what's going on in our, in our market space. Um, so polyethylene and polypropylene together in the United States of America is about 67 billion pounds a year. What does 67 billion pounds mean, right? So trying to break this down, share this, uh, did five different presentations last week with uh, all the different groups on our team just to you know run this by them. We're trying to find ways. It's great to have a team with an average uh, expect or average tenure in the business of 20 plus years. So everybody's kind of got their own opinions. I will tell you, I got a few, but the reality is, is it allows us to come up with some presentation here that we hope makes sense, or maybe that you can turn around and please use this with your customers. Um, so that's that 966 rail cars a day is how many rail cars the producers in the United States of America to combine polyethylene polypropylene make a day. That's 183 million pounds a day. Uh, with 88% of the capacity offline, that, that's 850 rail cars a day of lost production. So a little over 161 million pounds per day. Um, hate to say it, but it's like as of last Friday, not even counting the weekend in, in the last two days, 12 days since Yuri, uh, my quick calculations, and I mean, you know, this is the back of the napkin type stuff, but is 10,200 rail cars of production has been lost. That's equal to about 1.9 billion pounds. Uh, again, unprecedented. Um, I, I, the only thing I, I can kind of to try to put this in perspective for us is that is that as a group, you know, if we saw a hurricane hit into the Gulf Coast and you kind of everybody watches it, everybody braces, some of the production plants get shut down just in case. But if it hit, you know, finally it hits and if it hit East Texas, well, the first thing we do is pull out the map of, of where everything is located that probably got affected. Then the second, really the, probably the most important thing is we know pretty quick all the plants that weren't adversely infected. So they may, they may, they should be able to, if they did shut down, they may only shut down for a day or two, they'll be able to come back up. So we can get a quick read within a 24, 48 hours of a hurricane as to probably what we're up against. The reality is this is like a, a major hurricane that just hit all of Texas and Louisiana at the same time shut everything down and the hurricane sat there for a week, i.e. freezing temperatures for a week, so you couldn't even go in and repair anything. So again, this is, this is there's nothing we can compare this to. Uh, the historic pie chart, that was the other thing, the other way I tried to show this, the historic pie chart is actual production. So typically, and uh, this is rough numbers, all right? So typically 90% of polyolefins are up and running. Those plants are up and running 24 seven all the time, right? The only reason they ever come to take them down, the only reason that North America can take them down because we're a low cost producer, is you got to do maintenance or you have a production issue. So historically it's 90% or higher um, are actually up and running. Uh, to look, turn around and see that only 12% of the capacity is actually running 12 days in, almost two weeks in after a shutdown, that's, it's unbelievable. 1.9 billion pounds a year is basically a brand new one of the brand new super plants everybody talks about that take, takes them five years to build, that's gone. In 12 days, we wiped out that capacity. So that production, I'd say, is gone, gone, gone forever. And the reason I say that is they, this isn't like they can work Saturdays and Sundays and make up, or they can put a, um, you know, maybe, maybe put a mold in a press that they can run a little bit faster and try to catch up. They, they're already running wide open. They cannot go any faster. Um, they have every incentive in the world. They're making great money on what they can make. So they are incentivized to, to get these plants up and running and keep them running. Go ahead, Jeff, on the next one. So for us, what we're looking at right, right now is the timing of the restarts. And as we spoke a little bit before on the flow chart, it's really going to be both the monomer and the polymer plants for us. 
they'll be the true indicator of how fast we recover. So based on my opinion, as soon as we get back to full normal allocation, and I say that because we have been on allocation since last year, but no extra, uh, we'll be late second quarter. We may come off force majeure, but that doesn't mean we come off allocation. So if in fact we can get the plants, or most of the plants can get back up by mid-March, my best guess is that we'll have a good chance of getting back to some kind of normal full allocation in the June timeframe. But that's a big assumption that we can get most of those plants back up again. But as of today, that's what everybody's kind of, that's when I talk to uh, my counterparts, that's kind of what we're all thinking. And the other problem that we've had, and when Jeff showed it real well with all the, with all the uh, ships out there traveling, is uh, speaking to a friend that's over in Europe now, runs one of the businesses over there, said, we're in a bubble. We're in three bubbles uh, as, a, as for us as a group in the commodity side. We have the North or the Americas bubble. So everybody that's in the Americas can kind of, we can, we can handle the logistics, but we can't really afford to export and we can't afford to import because there isn't cargo space available or our price doesn't make sense. The same can be said for the European and, and it basically into the Gulf states. So they're kind of in their bubble over there. And then you have the bubble that is Asia. So again, we're all stuck and we can't, we really can't help each other out because there isn't enough containers available. Or when you, if you can get a container, it's so far in advance, nobody wants to commit to it. And or the price is so prohibitive for the cost of the value of the resin that it's, that it's just not worth doing. So we're into something we've never seen. We're gone kind of backwards. We're no longer a world uh, thing. It's, it's, we're in these three bubbles out there. Go ahead, Jeff. So this is the thing that uh, kind of keeps me up, keeps me up at night. So uh, will the shortage of materials for packaging consumer items, which by the way is over 50% of the polyethylene and polypropylene consumption, goes into either packaging or into a consumer disposable type item. So when when we run out of stuff on the shelves. Will we get the panic buying and hoarding that happened? Uh, think of the paper products of last spring. Um, if that happens, uh, what we could see actually is what we call the bull whip effect. Uh, I would tell you to go out and uh, put it, uh, if you put it up on Wikipedia, they have a great page on what the bull whip effect is all about. It's a, it is a true effect on the supply chain. And when you kind of read through it and you kind of apply it to what we're up against now, and again, we're, we're talking about hoping that supply comes back up by the middle of the month, that type of thing, is that we could really see uh, a, a real hyper demand. And what I'm really worried about is then the high prices continue through the rest of the year and we sit with ongoing allocation. Again, we may get back up to full production and we may get back up to full allocation, but there won't be any extra. And again, we never, and it just feels like we don't catch up. The bad part about that is it's not good for our industry. Uh, it's kind of the last thing any of us want. Um, because it's it's we're not talking about the good things we're just talking about we're just playing defense we're not playing any offense. Sorry, Jeff. To the next one. Okay. Turn so, over to you, Jeff. Thanks. Yep. Sorry. Thanks, Bruce. That's okay. So, going to head through and and do um, a review of the primary ETPs for for the sake of time. Uh, we're we're about um, forty eight minutes in, so. I am going to try to move through this part a little bit quickly. Happy to engage individually as needed. Um, Troy kind of talked about this early on uh, at the start of his presentation. And this is a, a letter that we, a snippets from a letter from Selenese, which frankly um, was mirrored by a number of other uh, ETP suppliers. Uh, basically reading the same thing. There's really four pieces that come in these letters in the last couple of weeks. One is talking about just their plant and their people. Um, you know, has power been restored? Uh, are our people safe? When can we begin to assess damage, which is happening right now, ordering repairs and, and getting that done? That's the first piece. Then they, this sounds a lot like what Bruce was talking about. Then you get into the allocation plan. Um, you know, producers right now uh, are determining what their production wheels are going to look like. Uh, are they going to go with a long production wheel um, where they're focusing only on high volume products, kind of their core products in their business and get those out in longer chunks? Or are they going to go through more of a shortened wheel where they're going to build a, you know, a little bit of their entire portfolio to try to feed the masses? So the product teams at the producers right now are trying to determine what that looks like in advance of their startup. 
once that's done, we'll have an idea of what the allocation is. Um, and that'll get communicated to both distributors and to their direct customers, at which point a company like Amco will be able to allow our customers uh, to know when we're going to be able to get product to them and in what amount. Uh, lead times are the next thing. So lead times are constantly getting extended. It seems every day we're getting lead time notifications. Uh, and then, of course, um, the dreaded transportation clause that talks about uh, the shortage of, um, of vessels and the shortage of transportation domestically. So what we're finding, and, and I'm sure you're facing the same frustrations um, yourselves, is we're placing orders with producers. They're not being confirmed um, at the time of order placement. We don't know what we're going to get, when we're going to get it, and the price is often moving at the time of shipment. So it it is very, very difficult. Um, for all of us to begin to plan and understand what our business from the supply side is gonna look like moving forward. I'm gonna hit maybe five or six different resin families specifically. If you look at styrenic copolymers, uh, you're gonna see some common themes that follow in the slides ahead. Uh, in, in styrenic copolymers domestically uh, and frankly globally demand uh, far exceeds supply. And domestic producers are on force majeure and imports are limited. Prices are going up um, and imports, in fact, are, are rising. Uh, prices for imports are rising faster than, than domestically. At this point, uh, I think the forecast is that price increases are going to continue until likely um, through second quarter. And it won't be unless there's something that changes structurally. You're, we won't see... Uh, Prices moving back the other way until the end of the second quarter and likely into third. Nylon six and six six. If you look at nylon six, both BASF and Advancic, uh, Advancic have been impacted by the storm. Uh, we've got short derivative supply there. I think that's likely to improve uh, in short short order. Six six is really where the struggle is. You know, key feed st feed stocks of adipic acid, adipic nitrile. HMDA, acrylonitrile, um, they've been tight globally before this happened. Europe's in a similar position. So we're not gonna be able to go to Europe to get uh, equivalent products and bring those in. Ascend, Invista, and DuPont have all declared force majeure and the market really on the 6-6 side is expected to be tight through the first half of 2021 and I'd anticipate prices will continue to rise. Um, I think on the 6-6 six, six side, producers are gonna favor products that have some sort of a filler so that they can stretch their, um, their short nylon polymer as, as long as they possibly can. Um, one thing that I would suggest is that if you have the ability to move, if you're in 6-6 six, six today and have the ability to, to move to nylon six, I think that would be something that you should be really heavily considering not only uh, in short term to be able to get supply, but long term, uh, there's a long term cost benefit of moving to six domestically. Polycarbonate, um, boy, this reads a lot like ABS does. Um, demand just exceeds supply. Uh, you've got domestic producers uh, have both declared force majeure. Europe and Asia, demand for polycarbonate is also very strong, so there's no no benefit of getting imports anytime soon coming from either Asia or from Europe. In fact, prices in Asia are higher. Uh, they came back from the Lunar New Year and um, came back to seeing prices escalate very, very quickly. So again, I would expect prices to continue to rise through the first half. I do think that there is uh, opportunity for both material availability as well as um, some price um, Prices beginning to fall as we, we hit the second half of the year. PBT um, supply is tight. A lot of the polymer for PBT comes to the US from Asia, which is being delayed because of logistics issues. Obviously costs are going up because freight coming from Asia to the US um, has more than doubled, as I mentioned earlier. I think we're looking at a tight market with rising prices. Um, in PBT, at least through the first half. Acetel, again, repeating myself, supply is tight and is expected to be domestically. We've, we've got force majeure events. Um, all product is on allocation. Imports are limited. We're seeing prices rise. Uh, again, um, we're looking at, at a tough road here for the first half before things begin to loosen 
in the second half of the year. Just a couple more product families as you get into the elastomer space with TPE. So this is gonna be TPO, TPE, TPV, SCBS type products. Uh, demand is strong. Uh, automotive being uh, as strong as it is right now is really helping the TPE market. Uh, key feed stocks have though been impacted by uh, winter storm URI with polypropylene, uh, EPDM, SEBS and curatives with propylene and curatives both on force majeure. Uh, I think we're probably looking at getting through May uh, with some inflation, and then uh, we should begin to see things loosen as we get through second quarter. So not quite as bad on the elastomer space compared to the other products that I've been speaking of. Uh, lastly, uh, TPU. Um, demand, again, is strong. Uh, it, the storm really um, impacted the TPU market with both MDI and uh, PTMEG. Uh, both being uh, impacted significantly from the storm. So polyether-based TPU um, is going to be really tight with force majeure events there. Um, one key producer did declare force majeure on MDI, um, but I think that you're going to find that polyether TPU is going to be tight with likely in, uh, price inflation and first half polyester should be a little bit better. It's going to be tight in the near term with, with uh, issues with MDI but I would expect that uh, come April, that should improve. So for some good news, um, some less impacted ETP. So um, there's products like PPE and PPO. You might be familiar with uh, Sabic Naril, PPS like um, Celanese Four Strand, PEI like Sabic Ultem, uh, Polysulfone like BASF Sultrason, uh, copolyester like the products from Eastman and Transparent Styrenix. Um, so products like NAS, SB Copolymer, which uh, K Resin and Styrolux from Ineos Styrolution Styro Styro would be products that are in fact open for business. So it's not all, not all doom and gloom. Okay, with that, uh, we're into the action step uh, to help reduce the impact of the crisis. So I'm gonna transition now to Bruce with uh, the first slide to talk about it. Right, we thought the most important thing was to come to you, guys, come to you folks with some ideas on how to how to best handle this situation. I was that interesting to hear your lawyer, Alan, bringing up some ideas on how to handle your customers. Uh, before I get into this, I would like to say that, you know, you got, we're all together in this, uh, is how we look at it from a supply standpoint. So if there's anything and everything you need from us, as you're kind of seeing what, what we put out here, we can drill down, uh, uh, much deeper on each product, if it's a product maybe specific to you to help you uh, qualify with your customer, quantify to your customer what the issues you're having on supply. So that is one of the things we are proud of at Amco. It's just the long-term uh, long experience of everybody on our team and the depth that we have. So um, again, we're, we're here for you. Um, on the impact of the resin crisis, uh, first off, the most important thing is if you've had normal purchases of resin that is now on an allocation, whether it's force majeure or not, make sure you're working with your current supplier. Make sure you're giving them that letter going, hey, I wanna make sure I'm getting my allocated amounts, right? Uh, and make sure, you, make sure you're pushing and getting your POs into them and making sure that they perform as best you can. So if in fact you're buying branded prime from a branded prime distributor, you know, they should have allocation for you, however that works out, and they usually do a pass-through, I know we do from our suppliers, but I mean, there should be some kind of a program that should, they should be able to explain to you, and you should be making sure that you're getting your fair share. Um, also, make sure you talk to your suppliers, and ensure you have adequate credit availability ahead of time. Uh, you don't want to be caught up uh, caught up at the very end with, oh, well, you know, we gave it to somebody else because credit wasn't there. Uh, I will tell you, we're working with our customers right now. Uh, we've uh, we're, we're also working internally with our credit department and they totally understand the situation. It is what we're, it is, and we're doing our best to help everybody out. Um, it's qualifying alternative residents and, and require multiple resident pools. Well, we all know that we should always be doing that no matter what, uh, but lean on us uh, and or your technical service support from your suppliers, because the reality is, is there, there are things we can help you with. Uh, we may be able to help you get a, you know, polystyrene emergency acceptance into an ABS or vice versa, depending on what's available today. 
And maybe both are tight at the moment, but it may be worth getting that second one approved because maybe one will improve sooner than the other. So at least you can get something to your customer. So we're there to help with that. Um, and make sure that you're working with authorized distributors with contracts and assurance that apply with the residents of producers. So when we as AMCO, you know, for the most part, we're back to back with our suppliers with the contract. So you know, we are making sure we get our fair share. Uh, that's our job to do that and, 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 to, and to be fair, bringing that back to you. Uh, and be ready to give long-term commitments for supply today. So again, everybody's looking to be bailed out today. I can tell you that the phone doesn't stop ringing, uh, but really we're looking for people, we're helping our, our ongoing customers first, but we're, you know, be prepared if somebody says, all right, I'm gonna jump in. I've got the ability because of whatever reason to help you, that they're probably gonna want the, they're gonna want a commitment back. And that's only fair. Go ahead, Jeff. So how to reduce the impact of resin crisis use now and going forward? So we call it the belt and suspenders vaccine for polymer supply issues because they always happen. Uh, it's over 90% effective. And if you do have supply issues, they're typically not as severe. Kind of sounds like things we're hearing about the news. Hi, here's how it works. Uh, partner with a branded distributor on a formal supply agreement. Um, and I say that is, you know, you can work out the, the terms and can, the T's and C's, but get yourselves on agreement on what, how you're going to do your business together. That's all you're doing. It's formally writing down how you're agreeing to do business. In that, make sure you're spelling out your volume requirements, your PO and your forecasting process in the agreement, and then live to that, right? The most important thing is, is that if you, if you, if you spelled it out in writing and then you acted on it and now you have history, then that helps us all make sure we're doing the right thing. Right. I mean, I like to say we are giving preference because we have, we have to to our contract customers when it comes to allocation. But the reality is, is that that doesn't mean they get all our allocation. It gets the means they get their fair share of the allocation that they PO'd and forecasted prior to, just like we had all agreed to. So it's important to spell those things out. And, and really, it's really it's just a, it's it's going to the next level of describing how you're going to do business together long term. Um, you will get your fair share when the issues happen. That's the best part about that. And they will happen. I mean, to, for us to see what we're seeing now, it's unbelievable. Uh, but sooner or later, issues do happen. So again, to work together. These key elements really work together for the best coverage. We call it keep your pants up, uh, the belts and suspenders uh, for our customers and for us too. Because to be very honest with you, a successful customer for us is a success for us. Uh, for a successful customer for us is also a success for us. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, it's uh, the last slide here. So um, really trying to focus on what would make it easier on your operations. And the unfortunate reality here is part of this is going to require you to um, potentially add cost, which is the exact opposite of what our businesses are trying to do today. If you look at um, the top, I've highlighted three bullets um, in the slide and it's really, Making it easier on your operations, one, provide a delivery window. Instead of giving a hard date, which might be your drop dead date, give a window. If you can give a supplier two to three days to deliver, the likelihood of that supplier hitting that delivery window is very high. 95% of all delayed shipments deliver the following day. So if you can give a delivery window, that will help your supplier. Obviously, provide ample lead time. Be talking with your suppliers about what their current lead times are and what you can do to make sure your orders are in line with those lead times. And then lastly, you know, if you can, if you have the space, the ability to actually get it, to hold some additional inventory, whether that be raw material, uh, finished goods, or work in process, so that uh, in the event that there is some sort of a supply disruption, there is a little bit of a buffer. So that's what uh, we we had uh, prepared today. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to just spend time with you uh, and share kind of a broad perspective on the market. Um, we're certainly very appreciative of um, being a primary sponsor for MAP and being able to provide views to its members. Um, you know, a lot of the information here is, seems to be doom and gloom, and that's just the reality of where you are. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, we're here to help. And uh, if there's anything we can do to have conversations with you, there's a lot of content we reviewed. We're happy to either through our commercial team or with Bruce and myself um, to engage with you to directly to review the whole thing or parts that were specifically important to you. 
and um, would also offer if you need some support in talking with your customers uh, relative to what's going on in the market with supply or with price, uh, we're certainly able to go shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm with you to support you with those discussions with your customers. Bruce? Yeah, just to add, really just to put on, go on top of what Jeff's saying, uh, we're here to help. That's that's our job. That's what we love to do. Um, it's kind of funny, but in my 40 years, in the beginning, I asked old boss when I got on the polymer side, and I said, when am, how, how long do you think it's going to take me to figure this industry out? And he said, I'll tell you, you'll know when you figure this industry out. He says, you're going to cut yourself by accident someday. Instead of blood, pellets are going to come out. Well, I'm going to tell you, pellets come out of me and Jeff, but we also got a whole team out back that bleeds pellets. So please reach out to us. Please use us. We're, we're really proud to be members of MAP, and we're proud to be here to help uh, help everybody at MAP be the most successful as, at all possible. So again, we're here for you, um, and, and we're ready to drill down on any specific questions. So Jeff and I, we've got our teams that also, you know, that even on, a, on a, each individual resin basis can drill down deeper than we can today. And, and we're there for you. And like Jeff said, shoulder to shoulder with you and your customers. We've been doing a lot of those calls and uh, it sure helps. It's, it doesn't hurt to uh, sometimes put some of the some of the uh, thing, uh, some of the complaints and some of the pressure you're feeling off onto a third party. And we're happy to be a third party as a partnership. So we're here. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Jeff, for sharing your expertise today. Um, and also thank you, Alan, also of Benish. Um, so just one more reminder um, for those of you who might have missed it in the beginning, I will be sharing the recording and the slides of this. Um, it will be available on the MAP website. Um, or if, again, if you're a customer of AMCO, um, they will get that out to you as well. Um, so at this time, if you do have questions, go ahead and use the question box. Um, and we will ask them out loud for you. I did have two that came in as we were going through. Um, the first one was, um, are, are you able to provide the source of the chemical industry flow chart? Yes, that's, if you're looking for a copy of the flow chart, um, that is available at ancopolymers.com. Um, we, and, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm not sure if we put the link on the, and the slide deck or not that will be going out but it's on the front page there's a link to the to the to the page the literature page but right on the front page of ancopolymers.com uh there's a link to the link i guess it's the best way to put it but you're welcome to download that it's pdf um and like i said it's easily printable up to a two by three poster okay awesome thank you um and then um we did, oh, we did have a question about resins that AMCO was producing or providing, but I believe you covered some of that. Um, also that question asker left, so that is up to you guys. Yeah, I just threw our, uh, for the sake of answering that question, you can see our line card here um, for those that are interested. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't have any more questions right now. Stacy, Shelley, do you have any questions from your end? No, I just want to thank uh, you guys and thank uh, Jeff and uh, Bruce. Uh, we spent a lot of time putting this together and we're going to be utilizing this presentation as well with a lot of our customers that weren't able to join today. But there's a lot of data here. Uh, there is a lot of information. Please take some time to go through it. Uh, there is no quick fix. It's going to take a long time for us to recover from this, and there's no model in uh, the timeline that it's going to take to recover from the whole state of Texas and part of Louisiana being shut down. So uh, we're here to help. Uh, we are very proud to be part of the MAP organization. We want to help all the MAP processors be as good as they can possibly be and compete in the world, and uh, we're here to field any questions you may have. Um, okay, we did get one question um, as you were speaking just now. Can you provide more details on ABS demand drivers? Yeah, I think if you look at the demand drivers for, for ABS specifically, automotive, um, certainly automotive demand for ABS is significant. I also talked a little bit about the um, 
consumer demand in HVAC, uh, not HVAC, and refrigeration and white goods. I think if you look at what's really driven demand, it's been the the surge in demand for consumer spending in white goods and automotive. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so I also wanted to give a just a shout out quickly on March 10th. Um, we are putting together a um, senior leader peer exchange um, for the MAP members on the line today to um, just share um, with each other on this topic. Um, you can go to the MAP website to register for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Troy. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcel. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, Jeff and, and Bruce, 63 years of experience I'm staring at right now. And uh, I know you guys are running hard, uh, but to put together that information, man, uh, truly appreciate it. You know, I take myself back to, uh, to August of 1996, when our founding fathers uh, basically said, incorporate this thing, Troy, and make it go. It was that concept of, of the village coming together. And, and you guys are an important part of it. All our, of our sponsors are an important part. And the intellect that you guys brought together, amazing. So thank you and thank AMCO uh, for what you've done today for us. Uh, something I want to tell everybody, we've had over 1,000 visitors uh, so far to our brand new created segment of materials available on the website. Uh, so right now, I think we've got six to eight postings. Uh, if everybody posts two or three materials, I got a text during uh, your conversation. Uh, we've got a member, a larger member that has three million pounds of obsolete inventory right now. And I said, please take the time uh, to get it on the site. And something that you have to understand is that we can communicate uh, with your ERP system. So you can download uh, your available material, your obsolete material onto an Excel sheet and upload it. Uh, very easy to, to search. And that way, again, we're helping other people. And I think that's very, very important. We're, you know, in my director's letter that just came out in Plastics Business, I talked about this nasty word called inflation. And uh, we're being hit from all ends. Uh, two things I just identified, I've got some marketing material on my desk right now. Our Granger program is continuing to save uh, people tons of money uh, and also our shipping program with partnership. You know, we're giving discounts in FedEx uh, from 25 to 45%. If you're looking for ways to pinch pennies, start using the programs. That's what, can, what I can tell you. And last but not least, our healthcare uh, captive is growing uh, and it's becoming a more and more of a go-to uh, opportunity and program for members that are looking for a a, a different approach to saving money when it comes to healthcare and improving the benefits that they offer. So that's my short commercial. You got to use the system in order to benefit. Those that used it today, over, well over 200 people, I think, uh, Bruce and Jeff, uh, used the system to listen to some great intellect from you guys. So again, thank you very much. And for everybody that participated, uh, thank you again. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. See you all. Thanks for having us. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.